If you have the capability of, of reducing the, the uh, environmental impact of the population you have deliberately kept down on the farm, deliberately kept under a lid so they don't have pollutionless technologies, they don't have free energy, then obviously the only way you can, can go is to limit the number of people that are going to be on that planet, which is your kind of vacation spot. And so there is a, a rationale, as awful and immoral and as bizarre as it may seem, to ultimately look to see if there are ways to reduce the population to where there is just a kind of a caretaker population on Earth and you get to live anywhere you want to and if you want a nice open skies, you know, sunsets and, and broad seas, you can come to Earth because it will now be pristine once again. That makes a kind of a rationale for why they would want to eliminate so many workers here because, frankly, they don't need them. Well, and that would also make sense from the point of view then that the, this incredibly well-funded green movement that we see on the rise right now is trying to tell, turn us all into Luddites as well because we're not getting access to the real clean energy, free energy, anti-gravity that you mentioned before. So we're kind of going backwards as well on the, on the, on the surface here, if you know what I mean, Richard. Well, you, again, this, this follows the model exactly, because if, if, if they have to keep some of us around for, like, maintenance staff, okay, serfs, slaves, whatever you want to call them, uh, because bodies, remember, are a lot cheaper than technology. Yeah. Even in a, in a world where you don't price things, it is so much easier to tell a human being what to do than to tell a robot what to do, because robots, even the best of them, break down. Hmm. Yeah, it's true, it's true. So what what are we looking at here in terms of, uh, I mean, for, again, if we if we look examine this logically rationally, uh, if they are behind some of the uh, the major catastrophes that are happening on the planet right now, Richard, uh, oil spill, uh, nuclear meltdown here at the facilities, if, if that's what they are, how how does that play into this? Because that makes it even more dirty, right? What's going on? Well, remember, it's only a short term. They are thinking long term. Transitions are messy. You have to get from here to there, right? And if, if going back to what I said earlier, this physics, this technology allows you to extend human lifespans to extraordinary levels, where is the last time we read in, in actual documents that human beings lived, you know, a thousand years? Probably the Bible, I guess, huh? Basically. And where is that derived from? What culture? What population the uh, i would say the essenes but the the hebrews i guess or the hyksos if you look at some of the other people out there yeah exactly so if if they have now been able to regenerate that that ancient knowledge to where they can live a thousand years productively then they can afford to take the long view let's say it takes a hundred years to totally transition from the population on the earth we have now to where it's down to where they are happy and the earth re is returned to somewhat like the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Well, a hundred years, if you live a thousand years, is one-tenth of your lifespan. That's for a, a, a human being now. Uh, if you live 60, 70 years, that's like six years. <laughs> So even uh, oh. even nuclear uh, radiation is is no big here, or maybe they even have cleanup well, remember, technologies that we don't know about. Well, remember the nuclear radiation can be ameliorated with this technology, so it goes away in in hours. How do I know that? Because some years ago on Good Morning America, some friends of mine demonstrated a pebble bed cold fusion technology that in 20 minutes reduced by half the radiation on live television uh, in, a, in a beaker uh, that, that has a half-life of four and a half billion years. Let me repeat that. Mm. Uranium breakdown takes four and a half billion years to get rid of half the uranium which is fissioning. They were able to demonstrate um, from cold fusion technologies on Good Morning America years ago on live television the ability to break down that nuclear waste in 20 minutes and not have to wait four and a half 
billion years for it to go way by half. So those technologies, again, could be used to ameliorate what's going on in Japan right now. They could have been used at Three Mile Island. They certainly could have been used at Chernobyl, and they were not. Because if we had access to those technologies, we get access to the whole ball of wax, as we say over here, and then we become their equals, and they cannot allow that. Ergo, we are being kept down on the farm in this transition until we could be moved aside for their plan for the future of their version of humanity. I mean, this is very scary and awesome stuff. And if I didn't have some good news at the end of this, I wouldn't even be talking like this. <laughs> what, is, uh, what is some of the good news, uh, Richard? Well, the good news is that unbeknownst to them, the banksters quietly took their knowledge and, and developed in secret laboratories, black ops, weapons labs and whatever, equivalent technologies and physics and that's why we're at war because our guys the guys that run us on earth the banksters in fact and you can call them the rockefellers or the rothschilds you know those cliched names but they in fact are now at war with these guys out there and that's why you're seeing in our model all the bizarre things going on around the planet because we're in a secret war where none of the protagonists want the slaves, meaning all the rest of us, to know we're at war for the first time in history. We're in a war that we're not supposed to know about. And all we're hearing is like, it's like you're in the jungle in the middle of the night, right? And you're gathered around your little fire and you're, you know, uh, roasting your, your, your roast pig over the, the, the spit or something, and you hear these big booms and thumping around in the darkness, and you have no idea what's out there. You just know that you don't want to get involved with it because it's a lot bigger than you are and probably a lot nastier, and you wouldn't come off very well. Well, the human race is like that. We're seeing all these weird things going on, they're being covered on the news as one thing when, in fact, they're merely the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the secret conflict, the secret competition going on between the guys who would be our masters and the guys who are their masters, and they're fighting it out, and we're not supposed to know, which is why there have been no horrific cities decimated or millions of people killed in one instant. The closest we came, I think, to that kind of awful horror was the earthquake in uh, Haiti, mm -hmm. which in an instant, you know, a few minutes, killed 200,000 people just days after the appearance of this incredible Norway spiral up over the northern climbs of Russia and Sweden and Finland, which was a signal just before President Obama was to receive his Nobel Prize that, in fact, he was to do their bidding and not what his own agenda might be, whatever that is. And I think we can see modern history reaching a major turning point on the morning of December 9th, 2009, when that spiral appeared over the northern pole, polar regions of Norway and Sweden and Russia and Finland, and things dramatically changed after that. Why would you build a nuclear plant in an earthquake zone at the edge of the ocean on a on a, on, on, basically on the shore with a lousy 25 foot high wall to prevent a tsunami from sweeping you back into the ocean when you know you live in a, a place for thousands of years that has had earthquakes and if you look at the USGS data or your own geological scientific people you can see that major earthquakes have been increasing for decades, monotonically, very predictably, and it's only a matter of time until a big one hits close to you and you have a huge tsunami roll ashore and do exactly what, what was done. Yeah. This is not rocket science. This is not magic. This is so predictable, and yet they've done nothing. Yeah. Have they done nothing to prevent it as they were told to do nothing? They, they've been uh, even making it worse because the Fukushima plant had actually kept over, I think, over 40 years of spent nuclear rods underneath the plant. So I think over, 
I think someone mentioned a number of about 600,000 spent fuel rods might potentially be uh, you know, radiating out as we speak because again, we c they barely can get close to these uh, damaged reactors. I think four in total now have been damaged. So we have no well, idea how much is get getting out there, Richard. What's interesting is we're not given accurate numbers. We don't have an accurate survey. We don't even have cutaway drawings of what the plant looks like. We don't have, you know, in, in independent readings of the radiation. We are we are literally living in a controlled disaster unfolding, and that's not even counting the horrors of the earthquake, which has killed untold thousands of people, and then the tsunami, which drowned those that managed to survive. I mean, this is this is a three uh, triple whammy, and it's not being responded to in the way that other disasters have been responded to in, in the past. And I think, again, this is nearly a speculation because I don't have hard data yet, but it fits to, to me the, the model that, yes, we're involved in a secret space war between humanity here on Earth and whoever our masters are out there who have evolved off Earth, as Dolan says, in the last 60 years into this stunning breakaway civilization, and we are being basically blackmailed into staying here and minding our P's and Q's and doing exactly what they say. And if anybody gets out of line, they can use this as an example of, see, this is what we will do to you, and it's only a tenth of thousands of what we can do, so you don't question. It's, uh, it's very strange, again, just what you, the, the point you bring up uh, about how uh, either other you know the international community is prevented from from helping out here in, in japan in one sense or another i mean look at how quickly they were uh, ready and and uh, willing to intervene in the internal affairs of libya now that wasn't any problem uh but here in, in japan where there is potentially the the entire population of you know the northern hemisphere is at, at risk <laughs> it's it's crazy well, I have heard numbers quoted something like 1,700 metric tons of radioactive rods, uh, you know, nuclear fuel rods that are stored in these ponds uh, waiting for when they can be transported to some kind of permanent storage off-site. And because these reactors were the first generation of nuclear reactors that General Electric built back in the 60s and 70s, they have to store those rods on site in a swimming pool, and they put them on the upper floors of the same buildings that are built around the reactors. Yeah. So if, if a catastrophe comes along and wipes out your reactor, it also wipes out your capabilities to keep those, those spent fuel rods cool, as we are seeing. I mean, this is like a perfectly scripted disaster perfectly scripted it's it's awesome to watch it's painful to watch and the only ray of hope that i think i can offer is that i think our guys have some secret technology that they are now using to ameliorate it because by my calculations we all should be living now under the same kind of disasters we have at chernobyl and the fact that we're not the fact that even specialists are saying on network television there are things going on here that we can't understand. It, it, it's not going the way we would think. Tells me that maybe we are actually quietly using some secret technology to ameliorate the radioactivity because we are not going to go peacefully as our masters want us to. We are fighting back. Yeah. But no one is allowed to know that we're fighting back.